Welcome to the Expanding Worlds podcast. I'm your host, Deborah Caldo. Back to my favourite topic, which as you know by now is work, but from a slightly different angle. I've spoken to quite a lot of people recently who I would describe as social entrepreneurs who have started up social enterprises. And we talk about that. We talk about the importance of social entrepreneurs and this kind of social enterprise in this actual episode. I'm talking to Guy from Scope, which is a UK-based organisation, which is focused around helping young people with additional needs get into work. And although this is a UK-based organisation, I'm sure wherever you are in the world, there are very similar organisations. So it's great to have people starting up small businesses from scratch. Maybe you even saw my Facebook Live last week from Ignition Brewery in London. They were celebrating their one-year anniversary of their tap room, and they're a really great example of social entrepreneurship and social enterprise. Nick and Will have created a sustainable business, which pays the people they employ, so it's not a charity, and it survives because the product is something people want. It just happens to provide employment for people with additional needs. So what scope is, I think it's a bridge between employment, and if we're really honest, that proverbial cliff that people talk about, that young people with additional needs fall off when they move from education and they don't necessarily have anywhere to go after that. And Guy explains all the things that Scope helps young people with, and they're all the kind of essential things that we think about, CV writing, interview skills and things like that. But he also talks about the importance of helping young people identify where they really want to go. Because as he explained, sometimes they haven't really sat down and thought about exactly what they want to do. They're just thinking about, I want a job, I want to work. And I believe that organisations like Scope are key. If you listen to any of the podcasts where people have started up a business which makes money so they can spend money on employing more people, all those organisations have behind them in some way, shape or form another organisation that's helping young people develop the skills that they need. Scope are a charity and they play a really important role, not in providing employment itself. What Scope and other organisations do really effectively is not create jobs, they help create the employees. They help develop the skills of the young people so that they can see themselves as employees, so they can see themselves as someone who can go out and get a job. So let's hear more about what Scope does from Guy. Today I'm talking to Guy Chodar, who's from Scope, which is an organisation based in the UK. Welcome, Guy. Hello. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself, first of all, and then also about Scope? I've been at Scope for nearly seven years, managing all of our employment services. And but previously to that, I've worked in apprenticeships, both here and in Australia, and also supporting people get into work. And in my previous life, I was a retail manager working for quite big organisations like Virgin and Harrods. So Scope, we're a national disability charity and we operate in England and Wales. And our real aim is about equality. So it's about equality for disabled people that they have the same rights and access as non-disabled people, be that in getting the best start in life, being financially secure, or to be able to live the life they choose. I work on, along with my team, is about employment. So I manage Scope's Support to Work service, which is our national digital employment service, which supports disabled people across England and Wales to help them find paid work in something they want to do and so my team really help people to identify what skills they have, identify organisations and areas and career paths that people want to work into and then really with the nitty gritty things about finding work from creating and evaluating a, a really good CV, developing a really good cover letter or working through application forms to things on interview skills and making sure that people are getting the right support be it reasonable adjustments when they start work or getting the right support in terms of any adaptations they might need for an interview or for an assessment centre as well. So how do people come to Scope? We have quite a presence on the high street with Scope's uh, retail charity shops, uh, which raise vital funds for the organisation. But also we do a lot of digital marketing and have a digital presence, so through Facebook and Twitter. And also we try to make sure that when people are looking for disability employment through search engines, that they find us as an organisation. So when someone does find my service, the Support to Work service, they can sign up online. And once they sign up online, within 48 hours, they'll get a call from one of the team to arrange an initial appointment with an employment advisor over the phone, or it can be via Skype or via email depending on people's needs or in terms of barriers to employment. So what kind of things do you talk about in that first phone call? The first phone call or Skype session is really about what people have done before, what they're looking for. So there's no real kind of hard and fast rules. It's very much about having an initial conversation and getting to know the person to see what they perceive are their barriers to employment or what the barriers they found previously. And then really working with them to create an action plan that's really personalised to themselves to say, right, this is the next step. You're telling me you've applied for thousands of jobs and we're not getting anywhere. So we're going to take it right back to basics. So 
first tool to finding a job, even now, it has been for a long time, is a CV. So if you're not getting interviews, there's something not necessarily wrong with your CV, but it's not doing the right thing, or you're not applying for the right jobs. So the team really take that back to basics, look at CVs, are they the right kind of thing? Are we applying for the right thing? Are people limiting their job search? Or are people just scattergunning the market and not being savvy in terms of what jobs they're applying for and just applying for everything, which then doesn't help at all as well. So. What would you say is the biggest challenge? Is that is a CV... Is that something that people um, struggle with? Not necessarily. I think some people just need a little tweak, and it can be just a little tweak from an unprofessional email address to too much on it. We've seen some CVs going back a good 20 years, and that's not very useful to... But then that's just one kind of barrier. Sometimes it's barriers of perception of people applying for jobs, and I think it's also about availability of work people want to do in their local area. So there might not be the opportunities that they can see in their local area, and sometimes that's a real barrier. Unfortunately, that's not a lot we can do about that in terms of creating those kind of jobs but I think how people apply for work especially how people perceive themselves is sometimes a real barrier we see a lot of kind of negative language on CVs of people saying I can't do this I can't do that I can't do this rather than talking about what's unique about them and talking about what they would bring to an organization as well can you talk a little bit more about that then is that something that I mean the, the big question that people often have with CVs, CV is whether or not they talk about what their additional need is Yeah, and I always think it's personal choice. And I think there are lots of really good organisations out there who really want to employ more disabled people. And if they are saying that on their job advert, then I think this is something you'd mentioned more in a cover letter on the application rather than sticking it on your CV. But I think knowing when to kind of talk to an employer about your disability is really important. And we've got lots of information about that on our website. But I think it's really about that personal choice, but also thinking about if I am to get an interview, would I need an adjustment at the interview? So it could be a physical adjustment in terms of if you're a wheelchair user and there isn't a lift or there isn't a ramp that's probably not going to be the best place for you to work anyway but thinking about what you need to tell someone so you might tell them when they're offered you an interview stage so I as a rule of thumb wouldn't put disability or a barrier on a CV but I really think about having a strategy of how you're going to talk to your employer about your disability about what adaptations you need we work with a lot of deaf customers who have text only written on their cv and that's a need for them because if someone rings them they can't don't answer the phone then they're never going to be able to get to employment so as a rule of thumb i'd say not on your cv but really think about when you're going to talk about it if you are going to talk about it and my suggestion would be to talk about it is if you think you're going to get as part of a guaranteed interview that organizations are saying here's a guaranteed interview if you're to disabled applicants then definitely need to talk about it otherwise you're not going to get that guaranteed interview but also if you need certain adjustments when you're going to start work is when you talk about it but if you're not going to need that and you're not going for the guaranteed interview type thing it's really your personal choice if you want to talk about it and it might be once you've started work you talk to your line manager about your condition disability or impairment or you talk to your team or you don't talk about it at all because it's it's your business at the end of the day when it comes to interviews, though, for some people who have additional needs and would say something like autism, mm-hmm. it might be something they'd mention yeah. in a cover letter, though. Yeah, definitely, because it talk about adjustments. So we're working with someone at the moment who an interview is quite a petrifying experience for him, and he is on the autistic spectrum. And he was sent to an assessment centre, and they just said in the email that they sent, obviously a standard one out, it's an assessment centre. To him, he didn't know what that meant, or he had perceptions or ideas. So we worked with him, and we didn't do this on his behalf. We got him today to say, go back to them and ask what is going to happen, because then he knew that it's going to be a group session and then it's going to be a one-to-one talk and then we're going to ask you these questions about that. So it was more about him saying, I'm autistic, I need to know what this is going to be so I can plan and organise myself. And I think sometimes recruiters are not necessarily trying to trip people up, but they just don't think about these things. And I, and I don't think anybody does it with any kind of malice. I think it is about people going, oh, this is just the way we do it. And I think a real reasonable adjustment is a change to the interview process. And that's something you can definitely request. So if you think you'd be better to show someone that you could do a job, then requesting a work trial or a trial shift is a really good way to show, oh yeah, I can do that, rather than somebody who's really good at sitting in front of someone and telling them they'd be good at their job, or being asked competency-based questions, so hypothetical questions could be a a real struggle for someone on the autistic spectrum, but somebody's saying, can you tell me what would you do in this situation? Oh, I don't know, I'd have to see, but somebody's saying, oh, when I have done this before, so they can talk more about their previous experience as well. I think asking for adjustments in interviews is really important, and I don't think people do it enough. I was just going to ask you, what do you think is the biggest challenge? You mentioned things like people going for the wrong jobs yeah. and maybe telling, saying too much on their CV. What, from your experience, is the biggest issues for young people looking for work? 
It's sometimes, and it goes back to school, and especially people who have additional needs or special educational needs, don't necessarily get the same opportunities as their peers in regard to like work experience or summer jobs and that kind of thing. So they haven't got anything to kind of put on their CV because they got excluded from doing work experience. So I think that can be a real challenge because when you're asked to apply for a job and a CV and you, and you haven't got anything to put on it, that's really difficult. I think it's also just about opportunity. So it's about grasping every kind of opportunity you can. I think access to apprenticeships is really difficult because apprenticeships until recently required people to have a certain level of maths and English and there has been a relaxation on that around people with learning disabilities but I don't think that has been well enough communicated especially to apprenticeship providers and employers so it's be making sure that people are aware of that that you can access an apprenticeship even if you don't have the level of maths and English they're requiring if you've got a learning disability especially if you've got an educational uh, healthcare plan so I think that's a real one but also it's just a bit about employer attitudes as well it's just people thinking oh this person's going to be more difficult this person's going to be harder to help and we supported someone in recent years who wanted to work within a creative field but was finding it really challenging to find that opportunity and we worked quite closely with an employer to really talk to them about what needs he had and what they could do to make the environment more accessible to him and that was really good. They came to us and said, we don't know what we need to do. And one of my teams sat down with them and said, well, think about breaks, think about quiet places, think about lights that might affect people and that kind of stuff. And it was really the employer's buy-in really helped that person to be successful in their role and really develop it and carve up kind of duties that he was able to do and then build on those activities as he got further into his time with the organisation. Do you think there's a misunderstanding of what reasonable adjustments are? I think people don't know what they are. I think in the field that I'm in and you're in, that we know what it is and we can see it. But I think the average person on the street who might own a small business or a shop or a restaurant or a cafe doesn't know what a reasonable adjustment is and wouldn't understand what it is. And I think that's a big education piece from us as an organisation, but also from a policy point of view from the government to lead down to be able to say, this is what a reasonable adjustment is. This is why you have to do it enshrined in law. And I think when people grasp that, I think that really helps. I think the problem is that the term reasonable is very varied in people's minds, so that doesn't help. I think once people are aware of it, they're like, oh right, I understand now, but I think the awareness isn't there. Do you think there's not a clear definition? Well, I think the definition is whatever is deemed reasonable. And so that is not clear, that is not a clear definition to me. That's kind of a tricky part of it as well. And I think there is that support and there's support through access to work, which I think is a really important scheme that also people aren't aware of. Once people have got that idea and nugget, sometimes it is, unfortunately, a case of the person looking for work's job to educate an employer to say, I've got these additional needs, or I've got these barriers, or I've got these support needs, but this is what we need to do. Here is a fund from the government from access to work that will pay for this all you need to do is agree to it and then I think people go oh right fine and I think that's unfortunately it's becoming the onus is really becoming on disabled people to push that rather than people understanding it in the wider business community do you think that's the big issue then cost I think that is cost and I think research we've done as an organisation in our policy and research team has said that that is one employer's attitude is a big barrier and I think it's more about employers understanding as well and that's what we really want to change as part of our work with me campaign is really focused on employers to show them that there is an untapped pool of disabled talent out there and that by being aware of reasonable adjustments and different schemes and different support that's out there that disabled people can be an asset to an organisation and are shown to stay longer in positions and be more productive as well. So it's a real win-win for employers. They just need to get on board with that. When you're trying to persuade them, do you say these young people will stay longer? Yeah, and we talk about that and we've got a lot of kind of research on that, but we really talk about the person, we talk about why they will be an asset and what we really talk to our customers that we work with is talk about how they can show they're an asset, how they can speak positively about themselves and show, like we would, you would advise anybody doing an interview, to show that you're a positive, motivated person that's going to be the best fit for their organisation and that's what everyone should do in an interview situation. Have you got some examples of employers that you think are just a little bit ahead of the game, I suppose? We work a lot with me campaign with Virgin Media and so they have really committed to becoming better employer of disabled people and doing a lot of work in that space. And I think also where I'm seeing a lot of really good work is in kind of like the social entrepreneur field. So lots of organisations that are setting up things like cafes or valet surveys for uh, disabled people. Um, and I think those are really good and seeing some real good growth. We work with a partner called Unlimited and they are really keen to promote social entrepreneurs for them 
to go on to employ more disabled people and then create more disabled entrepreneurs as well. Because self-employment and working from home is a really good opportunity for disabled people who might have access needs but also might have a fluctuating condition so that working from home or being home-based is a real kind of bonus and the internet has opened up those kind of opportunities and like Skype meetings and conference calls and shares means that you don't have to be nine to five in an office to be able to do a similar job and we've got people who work for us who are home-based and can do exactly the same as someone can in the office and probably get less distracted by everyone else around them anyway. In terms of helping people, you help them with CV writing, you help them with getting interviews and and talking about risk adjustments. When they're actually in employment, do you provide support to the employers and the A's? On our support to work service, we don't because we're a national service and it's more kind of advice and guidance. But we offer three other employment services which are much more localised face-to-face support and they're called Kickstart and Starting Line and they offer support to an employer, so what we'd call in-work support. And we work with an employer to ensure that somebody is comfortable and in employment and any kind of barriers or bumps along the way that come along. So we definitely do that with with those ones and we're just about to launch a new service which is so new it doesn't even have a name yet which we're launching across the whole of London for young people who are in education and it's more of a careers advice service because we're finding that the people are coming to us who are coming out of school with special education needs or additional needs and they weren't giving any kind of careers advice so we're going to be working with schools across London to work with disabled young people to give them kind of careers advice and goals and really work with them to think about what's their next step. If you had to sort of talk to parents who maybe won't have access to Skype yeah. or can't get help get yeah. the young person access to Skype, what kind of tips would you give them in terms of getting the young person ready for employment? I think it's keen about confidence and motivation. There aren't many jobs where you won't have to talk to somebody at some stage, so it's about being comfortable in those kind of social situations to be able to talk to someone, and then that can develop into interview skills and working across them. I think volunteering and work experience is really key, just to give people that, A, stuff to put on their CV, but also builds that confidence, meeting new people, learning new things, and really kind of seeing if that's the right kind of career goal. And I think it's about opening your eyes up to all the opportunities that are out there, so making sure that they're in touch with local council if they've got any kind of schemes to support young people. All councils I know are kind of targeted on recruiting young people and apprentices into their organisations. So it's really keen to look at that, to look at is the apprenticeship route right? Is the university route right? It's straight into work and how does that look? And looking at other supported employment services or looking at really just any kind of community groups that are really doing anything to develop those kind of skills as well. Because I think with most jobs, you can be taught how to do the job on the job. But it's a lot more what people are looking for our attitude and aptitude about looking at will this person fit in the team and so that kind of confidence to communicate to what I would call strangers is really kind of important because that that will really help in terms of that and developing those kind of social skills and social networks so it's really about thinking about those social kind of networks through and I'm not talking about getting a swanky LinkedIn profile I'm talking about just knowing your friends and where they're going to or people you're in a club with or an organisation that can really kind of help that kind of networking as well. I'm kind of getting the impression that often young people with digital needs then aren't really preparing for work in the same way that someone else might. I think that's where we're falling down is that people aren't being given those kind of skills to transition into work. So understanding from the stuff about applying for jobs from the CVs, the cover letter, the interviews to managing money to understanding the wider world. And I think that's where it needs the focus is about making sure that people are kind of prepared if they're able to and if they want to, to work and knowing how to work, how work works. And we do a lot of what we call world of work sessions. So we take a group of normally young people to different businesses that we're working with and they get an understanding of how the business works, how is the different parts of it, here's the different functions of the organisation and how they kind of fit together and what work is like. And also the understanding that sometimes work is quite boring. (laughs) Um, It is. And sometimes you might just be sat in front of a computer all day and typing and sometimes work isn't that exciting and understanding that what you think might be really exciting, getting some experience of it going, oh no, I definitely don't want to do this. And so having a real perception of what work is like is really important, I think. You're suggesting that we need to give young people more chance of doing work experience. Yep. The big challenge there is, of course, perceptions mm-hmm. among the more general employers, yep. especially with work experience being something you tend to do in a smaller organisation. 
I think lots of large organisations do have kind of like work experience schemes and I think it is good to get onto that but it is about challenging that perception again similarly with employers but I think work experience is a real kind of feeder into it and it doesn't have to be two solid weeks of work experience in that it could be a taster day or just to see what a day might like in an organisation and I think it's really about community engagement their corporate social responsibility to say this is what I would like and it doesn't hurt to ask and I think that's the key as well and saying why you want it and how it will be a benefit and then how be a kind of a benefit to them as well selling that but it is a tricky one and I don't think that barrier is ever going to go away in terms of not having that awareness is part of the kind of the barrier unfortunately but I think that's something to try and work with and try and make sure that people are getting the right kind of opportunities. And I would assume that the more employers that take on young people with additional needs, the more perceptions change. Yeah, definitely. I think people with research we've done that say that people, lots of people had never spoken to a disabled person or knew a disabled person. When you're looking at there's 14 million disabled people in the UK, that's a lot of people. And so I think it's all about perceptions. It's about better representation in the media, what people see on television, in soaps, in current affairs, in dramas, where their disability doesn't define the person, it's just part of them. And I think that really helps in terms of attitude attitudes that will really help on a wider part so I think that's a bigger part in terms of an attitude piece as well about changing people's perceptions to ensure that there is equality and that people can see that that becomes a norm and that's what we would like. Well, thank you very much for thank your time. You. takeaways it's essential that young people have the opportunity to explore their options to try and figure out exactly where they want to go and that they have the resources and the assistance to do that and also that it's important to try and get experiences of work along the way and I think this is one area where I'll be honest I don't think I've cracked it yet I don't think that my daughter has had enough experience of work in her life as always if you could leave a podcast review that would be great and if you have any recommendations for guests or for topics you want me to talk more about, then you can message me on Instagram or Facebook at Deborah Caldo, or you can email podcast at expandingworlds.com.